Hello and welcome everyone to this edition of the Chocolate Life Live. My name is um, Clay Gordon and I'm here to welcome chocolate fans of all flavors, no matter where you might be uh, tuning in from around the world today, uh, to this discussion about whether chocolate can be raw or whether chocolate can be paleo. Um, if, in case you're wondering, I am using a slightly different camera today for one reason or another. Um, I'm experiencing some technical um, technical challenges and the camera that I normally use um, just refuses to connect today. So what I want to do is get started off right away um, with this um, discussion of whether chocolate can be raw, whether chocolate can be paleo. And then we got a little bit of time to discuss um, something that came across my desk and whether it is a fad or whether it is fashionable. And uh, I want to remind everybody, whether you're looking at uh, watching today, whether you're connecting on YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn, you can go to the chat replay, the live chat, or into the comments, and you can put your comments into the live stream today. And so what I will do is I will take the opportunity to get them up on screen and to be able to answer your questions or comments. And, you know, just if you are interested, just let me know where you're connecting uh, in from today. We have people usually connecting from all over the world. And so would love to know where you are connecting today. So um, people who are regular watchers of this channel will know that I produce on the chocolatelife.com a post for every single one of my live streams. And so this is the homepage of the Chocolate Life right now. You can go there and you'll see that there is a story here. Chocolate can be raw and paleo. And if you click and open up that story, today this is what I'm going to be using as the presentation. So you can follow along from this story. You can have link to all the resources um, that are here. And um, again, if you have any questions, if you think I'm speaking a little too quickly, uh, being in New York as I am, um, I might be going a little too fast. Uh, let me know. Put your, put your notes in the comments. But the question about is chocolate raw and is chocolate paleo is a question that I get asked, um, surprisingly, uh, quite often. Um, people are, for some reason, concerned. Well, you know, for some reason, I think is um, the wrong thing to say. People are concerned uh, about the diet, what they're, they're consuming. And they want to know if the chocolate is good for them, or they might have some special dietary requirements. And two of the more interesting dietary uh, requirements, I suppose, are people, things that diets that people want to follow when it comes to chocolate, um, have to do with the question of um, whether chocolate is raw or whether it's paleo. And um, this is uh, the presentation on the chocolate life that we'll be following today. What I want to start off when I talk about either one of these two um, kinds of diets is where they originated from. So the concept of raw chocolate, the concept of raw food in general, right, is an idea that grew out of um, the American health movement of the 1800s. We might know that um, Kellogg, a gram of, of graham flour and graham crackers are two uh, names that come from, from the American health movement. But in the early 1900s, there was a, a researcher by the name of Ed Howell, and he had a theory of enzymatic nutrition. And the theory of enzyme nutrition, um, you know, broadly simplifying it, you know, it, it's, it's more detailed um, than this, is the notion that um, the pancreas in the human body can only create so many digestive enzymes over the course of its life. If you consume foods that do not have in them digestive enzymes, then what happens is the pancreas has to make them in order to break down the food. And if you exhaust the pancreas's ability to create digestive enzymes, you're going to die. Uh, and so what you want to do is you want to eat food that contains living enzymes. And that if you do that, then you will live a longer and presumably more healthy lifestyle or a longer and presumably more healthy life. So the question is, or the challenge is, is that this whole notion of enzyme nutrition is not something that has ever been proved scientifically. And yet, like many health theories, it is ones that proponents will grab onto and point to and then go take a look and um, look around and go, hey, this seems to make some sense to me, so I'm going to use it as part of my philosophical base for, for following a particular, particular diet. Again, the challenge is there's not a whole lot of modern science which suggests that the notion that, you know, if you tax the pancreas's ability to um, produce digestive enzymes, that you're going to um, have a less healthy life, and there's no, um, there's no uh, research to suggest that somehow the body knows whether or not the foods you're consuming have 
um, these enzymes, these living enzymes. Um, and my point today is not necessarily to say, listen, if the raw, if a raw lifestyle is what it is that you want to do, um, then, you know, go for it. I mean, I spent three years, about a decade ago, or three months, excuse me, three months, about a decade ago following a raw vegan lifestyle. I, it wasn't for me in the long run. I found that I was spending so much time thinking about how much food I needed to consume and how it was prepared because I couldn't cook any of it. Um, and was I getting the, the proper nutrition based on what I was doing? It was just too much work for me. Um, even though I took a, a trip down to Belize for a week um, with a bunch of people who were raw and vegans and you know, trying to um, make sure that they get fed properly over the course of the week was, was quite a challenge. So I, I understand, I've, I've tried to live it. You know, I understand the challenges. I understand uh, the appeal of it. But what I want to go and suggest that let's, let's toss aside the notion of whether the enzymatic theory of nutrition, so Ed Howell, the basis for this, um, let's just, let's assume that it's okay for the moment for, let's presume for the sake of the argument that it is in fact um, something that um, is scientifically valid and has been proven. Let's go take a look at um, a bunch of aspects of um, the raw um, diet that I personally have trouble with. And so if you're interested in this, these are things that you might want to pursue for yourself. And so number one, so five points that I want to pick in the raw agreement. Um, first of all, there is this complete lack of understanding of the physics of heat transfer. I'm going to speak specifically about cocoa and chocolate here, right? And then I'm going to be referring to this table of temperatures, which come out of this raw standard. So there is a quote unquote, a standard for what it means to be raw. It's here. You can click on this. You'll go to the um, page where they talk about the raw standard, you can download the standard. Um, it is linked to on the page, uh, you know, here it is. Um, and we'll be taking a close look at parts of it today, All right? So what does it mean to be raw? What does raw mean? But we have this notion that in order to stay raw, you cannot heat anything to more than 200 degrees Fahrenheit for more than two seconds. And you can't ever um, subject anything to a temperature over 211 degrees Fahrenheit. So for people who are in the centigrade scale, um, 118 degrees Fahrenheit here is 48.7 degrees C, just to get a, a, a basis on here. But let's take a cocoa bean. So you have a cocoa bean and the cocoa bean is surrounded by a shell, right? And in order to start cooking the bean, you need to have the heat penetrate the shell into the bean itself. Now, I can tell you from, his, from my personal experience that there is no way that even in a 200 degree oven, that if you were to put a single cocoa bean in the middle of a 200 degree convection oven, right, and you know, close the door, and you've put it on a, 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 an air fryer pan, so it's got all the exposure, that you put it in the oven for two seconds at 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and then open up the door and pull it out, there's no way that this, this, uh, the cocoa bean has been cooked, just not at all. I mean, it's just not happening, right? And so the first notion is that subjecting any food to an arbitrary temperature for this length of time is going to completely cook and completely denature all the enzymes in that food. It just, just doesn't work from a physics of heat transfer perspective. Yes, if I were to put a lettuce leaf in that same 200 degree oven, right? Maybe after two seconds, would all of the enzymes in that lettuce leaf or a kale leaf, right? Would all the enzymes be denatured? The answer is absolutely not, right? And so for me, the, 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 the first thing about cooking is that I don't understand um, this range of temperatures and I don't understand how any solid food, right? We would have all the enzymes denatured, right? In this short period of time, throughout the entire, the entire thing that's being cooked. So whether it's a grain of rice or whether it is a cocoa bean or whether it is um, a full-sized vegetable, these absolutely make no sense to me. Maybe the temperature will connect through the outer couple of microns of the outer shell, right? Or the outer skin, but certainly everything is not gonna be um, denatured, right? And I think we also have to be look at the language. It says, the following guidelines are offered for maximum heating temperatures and times to help ensure that the majority of enzymes do not become denatured and remain viable. 
So even if we believe that the theory of enzyme nutrition is right, a valid one, um, we have the whole notion of that these are just guidelines and, you know, it's like, uh, you know, okay, right? But where do they come from? This 118 degrees Fahrenheit for an extended period of time. So isn't it how much more than five minutes, right? Which is what we hear is an extended period of time. Specifically, if we go back to cocoa, right? Um, the fermentation pile is going to routinely get above 118 degrees Fahrenheit for hours at a time. And so if we are going to properly ferment cocoa beans, um, then I don't, it's, it's a real challenge to be able to ensure that the fermentation pile no, goes, does not go above 118 degrees Fahrenheit for any extended period of time. If we're gonna sun dry the cocoa beans, I mean, anybody who's been out on a concrete drying pad in a bright sunny day with cocoa beans on the pad um, will know that the temperature is above 120 degrees Fahrenheit for hours and hours and hours at a time. Now, it is possible to moderate that by putting the beans under shade, uh, by moving them in and out over the course of the day, but um, it is a real challenge to dry cocoa beans right, um, where the temperature doesn't go above 118 degrees Fahrenheit for extended period of times. So we've got that interesting question about what are in fact the physics of heat transfer? How does heat penetrate a bean or penetrate a food? And do these temperatures seem to make sense knowing what we know about the physics of heat transfer? The second one is that, you know, the idea that all foods react to heat in the same way which I would say is not um, the case. Uh, all foods do not react in the same way. I'm gonna have a lettuce leaf and I can put the lettuce leaf and put it at 125 degrees in a dehydrator and it will start to deliquesce relatively quickly, right? But again, I can take a cocoa bean and put it in a, um, in a dehydrator for 120, at 125 degrees Fahrenheit um, and it's going to show no observable signs of change. And so it's, it's really interesting to me that every food, right, reacts to heat in the same way. And this is not obviously the case. Some things have much less strong cellular structures, lettuces being one of them, um, and some things be very diff are, are very different. Um, there's also, also the question of moisture content. So some things are very high moisture, some things are very low moisture. And there are differing opinions about whether low moisture means that the enzymes last longer or high moisture means that the enzymes last longer, right? And so there is this, this, this interesting concept about what it means to be raw, right? So another thing that's you know, interesting to me is that somehow enzymes appear to be more special. So sometimes as a micronutrient, enzymes are more special than minerals and other sort of vitamins. And I don't understand this, um, this emphasis on enzymes. Again, I think it goes all the way back to Ed Howell and the theory of enzyme nutrition, um, which I believe has been debunked. And Keith, who's, um, who's participating today, says, hello, the raw food theory has devotees, but it's short on science, right? So, and, you know, this is um, another point I'm going to make is that bioavailability can also be improved by cooking. Uh, the tomato right? Heating tomatoes makes uh, lycopene more bioavailable. I mean, I think steaming broccoli is one of the better examples that I can think of, is that um, the nutrients in broccoli are much more available if the broccoli are steamed than if it is raw. You need to eat a lot more um, broccoli um, if it's raw than if it were cooked. And I think that the way I would describe that is that there's a difference between what is present in the food and what your body can take um, advantage of, which your body can metabolize. And we need to focus on the metabolites. We need to focus on how your body uses things. So not just the presence of a food, it's not just what you put in your mouth, but it's what your body um, can use and absorb. And then focusing on um, the quote unquote destructive nature of heat with respect to enzymes, right? And ignore the fact that it's, you know, it's been theorized, I've, I've anecdotal reports, um, which suggests that a lot of the health benefits of coffee, for example, 
are associated with roasting the coffee. That if you try to consume green coffee for any reason, the, the health benefits are not going to be, avail be available to you. That there is, in fact, an enormous benefit um, to cooking food. And if you're interested in more of that, there's a fabulous author by the name of Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan wrote a great book called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And one of the books that he wrote, um, which I can recommend, is called Cooked, A Natural History of Transformation. And if you're really, really interested in knowing more about cooking and how it transforms food, including some of the, including topics around bioavailability, I would recommend that you go take a look at this book, Cooked. Um, finally, once we get the benefits, you know, Keith, um, your, 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 um, your comment here sort of presupposes that the benefits are hypothesized. There's not a whole lot of science here. Um, and so, but it is something that intuitively makes sense. So if what we think is that foods which are less highly processed are healthier for you, then it makes common sense that foods which are raw, right, because they're not processed at all, are going to be the healthiest for you. Um, in fact, that may be true in some cases, it's not true in others. For example, there are foods, cassava would be one, manioc would be one, which contains cyanotic compounds, um, you know, precursors to cyanide. And if you do not actually prepare the foods properly, you're going to be consuming cyanide and you know cyanide is toxic. So there are examples of many, many foods which in order to become um, at all palatable in the human body, um, they need to be cooked. And we just can't overlook the fact that sometimes cooking is a good thing. And then we also is that this, again, this notion that heating is always destructive. Um, it is not. And so um, I would caution people to go take a look um, at um, the, their adherence to a strict raw regimen. I think there are cases where absolutely things that are raw taste good. Um, things that are raw are you know, highly bioavailable and things that are cooked and having a balance between the two is uh, very, very much something to be looked for in, in my opinion. And in cocoa and chocolate specifically, it is really, really difficult to be able to monitor the temperature of processing in all cases. So for example, I don't know of anybody who has done a measurement of the instantaneous shear temperature, which is between the grinding stone and the base in a stone melanger. Um, we do know that if you just get the grinder to working, that the temperature will rise. And so something is generating heat, and that is going to be the shear force generated by the friction between this grinding stone and the surface, right? But we don't know actually what that temperature is. And I would be tempted to believe that the instantaneous shear temperature is well above 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And so theoretically, if in fact co dried cocoa beans, right, number one, do dried cocoa beans contain living enzymes to begin with, right? I would say no. Dried cocoa beans do not contain living enzymes, um, but that would those enzymes um, survive under the pressure of grinding? We need to be really, really careful about measuring the temperature under the grinding stone. If I'm doing cocoa butter, trying to extract cocoa butter under 212 degrees Fahrenheit is a real challenge. So I would think about the process of what it means uh, to be raw. Um, right, and Keith says, way too much to say that can be said my 200 word limit. Um, food safety is just one example. Yeah, Keith, we're, we're going to go in um, to that. So if you go take a look um, at, there is a, there is a quote unquote standard. So it is not an official standard. Um, there is an organization um, which is called um, ICIS and they have this certified standard for raw. You can download the standard and go take a look at it. But if you go take a look at the standard um, and here it is, um, and uh, you can download it from the page. Um, now, it turns out this is not an ANSI certified standard. It is that this organization, Clean Food Certified, is a member of ANSI, um, so the American National Standard Institutes. So we go through this whole work, right? We, we look through it, and they talk about what it is that's going on. And I think that it's very interesting that the 
when they talk about the standard, they say there are three key elements. And the three key elements um, are food safety, that the product be minimally processed, and that there are bioavailable nutrients. Right? So cool. I mean, I think that um, not enough uh, manufacturers in general, chocolate manufacturers, um, think about the food safety issue. Um, we can argue about whether, whether minimally processed is um, important or not. Um, and in general, we want to say if we're eating something we want is the, you know, the most nutrients we can um, to be um, bioavailable. If we're paying, if we're not consuming a food just for pleasure, then having it be healthy for us is something that we would like the food to be. But somehow the uh, conflating food safety and minimally processed with, with the notion of bioavailability of nutrients tied to specific temperature is an interesting conflation of the standards. And interestingly enough, if you go take a look at the clean food standard, same organization, um, this is, um, what you'll do is you'll see that they make exactly the same argument that, that there is no difference between the certification for clean food, or at least the key elements of key food standard right, safety, minimally processed and bioavailability to the point where they actually forget to, you know, this is the clean food standard, this is the raw food standard, and um, they're both key elements of raw food certification. So there's some confusion, um, even among the standards organization. Um, so yeah, um, it's, there are these standards that are here. We're going to go to, um, this is the, the homepage, or not the homepage, but a page um, at the certified clean raw. So it's r.a.w. So they can trademark it. Um, this is the page where you can download the standards. All right. Um, but there is a link to this website um, in, the, in the, the post for today. So we come down here and they talk about, right, the things have to be non genetically modified. Everything needs to be below 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And then, as an interesting aspect of the standard, Right, they must be analyzed by Cytosolve. So Cytosolve is an interesting company. And here's where I have a challenge, which is that Cytosolve is a company which is owned by one of the founders of this organization, the International Center for Integrative Systems. So there's a guy by the name of Shiva Ayuradai, um, if you're at all interested, know anything about the technical in, um, world, you'll know that this guy, Shiva Ayuradai, claims to be the inventor of email. Um, now, it is quite true that he invented or developed something that had um, the as elements that we might consider to be a modern email system. It's not quite clear as whether he was the first person to actually create an email like messaging system. So, but he claims to be the inventor of email. He's been to court a couple of times um, to uh, try to prove, right? Or, or claim that he is. Um, he is a graduate of MIT. He has four degrees. Um, he does have a PhD and his, one of his PhDs is on, there is a, it's a you know, biological engineering, um, not necessarily microbiology uh, per se, but biological engineering. So he is the founder or one of the founders of this organization, um, Certified Clean Raw. We can go to the um, TED document here and we can see that he's the committee chairperson. Again, he's also one of the founders of the organization and he is the cha chairman and CEO of Cytosol. So I see a conflict of interest here. So he's got this organization, right, which is um, the, the International Center for Integrative Systems. He's got a standard for certified raw, right? But the sort of standard requires that you submit your products, which you want to be certified raw, to a for-profit organization called Cytosolve. And Cytosolve is um, owned, right, by... Um, Shiva Ayurdai. So again, there's a, what looks to be a little bit of self-dealing here um, and a conflict of interest um, that in order to be, in order to be certified um, as raw, you must, you must pay for a test and have your product certified by a company that I own. Um, I have a problem with that. 
Um, going forward and thinking more a little bit about raw, what does it mean to be certified? Um, products must be real, um, um, which means they need to be 100% safe and they must be 100% non-GMO. Um, you know, I like um, Michael Pollan's book. I'm going to mention Michael uh, again. Um, he wrote a book called Food Rules. And if you haven't um, read it, um, there's a link to be able to buy the book um, at the bottom of this post. And what's interesting about Food Rules for me um, is I, well, I love the idea, but I submitted um, a new idea for a rule to be added to his list of rules. And one of them was um, never um, avoid foods which, use the, which are advertised using the phrase made with real. And so I just find that the notion of definition of real must be safe and non-GMO um, is just an interesting construction for that. Um, they must be alive, right? Which means they have to have a high amount of bioavailable enzymes based on testing using this, this CS testing method, which um, again, I believe is mired in conflicts of interest. And they must be whole, which means they must be organic. So somehow a whole food and organic is a conflation I don't, I don't think works and have high nutrient density, right? So, okay, high nutrient density is an interesting kind of thing for people who are interested in it. Um, there is a link right in the document to this page where they talk about this um, Andy food rating. So a rating of nutrient density and they describe what that is. And it's very, very simple is nutrients over calories. Okay. Um, it's simple and straightforward. Keith, I don't know if you're familiar with this, if you're still watching, whether you've heard of it, but you can find that kale has a nutrient density of a thousand. Um, and, um, you know, you come down here, uh, cocoa isn't on this list. Chocolate isn't on this list. Um, uh, not surprisingly, cola go down all the way to the bottom, um, has a nutrient density of just one. So you have here in this scoring method, you have an idea of what particular nutrients they're looking for. And so, so they're looking for is that whole foods have a high nutrient density and things that are nutrient dense deliver a lot of these nutrients. And again, this is the presence of nutrients, not necessarily the bioavailability of these nutrients. Not all of them will be in a form that the body can absorb and use, but um, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. And Keith, again, I don't know uh, if you know anything about this and uh, you know, I'm not surprised to see that vanilla ice cream has a very, very low nutrient density, but again, cocoa is not on this list. Chocolate is not on this list and cocoa is often considered to be a superfood. And so it's confusing uh, to me that it's not even considered because it is in fact a controversial food um, in this community. So um, Keith, again, let's take a look at this. Paleo man had different issues. I absolutely, by age 35, he was dead. We're going to get into this next, right? No need for calcium, right? All this other kind of stuff, big issues, right? right. Certainly if you're, if you're a human living somewhere between 10,000 and well, when did 300,000 years ago um, that you had um, a lot more to worry about um, than if your food was raw. Um, so no, absolutely. So I would, I would caution people when they think about why it is that they are adherents to the raw diet, exactly what it is that they're, why it is that is the case. And to think about, right, and do the research into the theory of enzyme nutrition um, to understand its basis, right, and um, the science behind it. And then also to think about the physics of heat transfer, to think about how subjecting something to a very high heat for a very short period of time does not give the heat enough um, duration to be able to penetrate anything more than the outer couple of layers of cells of whatever it is that you're, you've subjected to the heat. And so, no, right? Um, you're, not, you're not killing off all the enzymes. And in fact, by choosing a balance of foods, you can get all the enzymes that you need and all the other nutrients that you need right? You don't, it's not a necessarily an either, or it, it, you know, it's like, there's a difference between vegan and vegetarian, right? So that makes absolute sense. It's clear cut. Vegan says no animal derived products. Um, and this includes insect derived products, honey, and things like that. And vegetarian says, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to exclude certain forms of animal derived products. And I'm going and other forms of animal derived products, ones that don't necessarily involve harming animals, cheese, for example. Um, 
So I, I can make that balance. And so I would, I would suggest that what people do is they think about raw exactly the same way, um, that there are some things that make sense being raw. There are some things that, in my opinion, don't make any sense being raw and that some balance. So could you be the vegetarian equivalent of raw um, as opposed to the vegan equivalent of raw? Um, that um, might, be something, might be something to consider when you think about, okay, um, the actual benefits that um, these diets um, do deliver to you. So that's it for raw. Um, I want to, so if you have questions about that comments, um, you're watching live, um, please um, put them in the comments and I will get them up on the screen. So paleo um, chocolate, right? Um, so again, I want to start off, what does it mean to be paleo? So believe it or not, and this is something that, you know, sub, you know that really, really surprised me is that there is in fact, um, a paleo certification organization, right? So this has been around for more than a decade um, and the Paleo Foundation is going to uh, provide guidelines for what can uh, be paleo and what is not paleo. So really, really interesting um, thing to do. Um, there is in fact, if you want to go look, I believe I've got the link to this. Um, there is a... Um, certified paleo standard that you can go download and um, you know you can read through it it's it's really quite interesting but uh, I think that you know for for me um, what um, what stood out um, when I started taking a look at what um, paleo was right I, I took a look at the document so um, historically what we think of as the modern paleo diet was first proposed in the 1970s Right. So by a gastroenterologist um, who hypothesized right, that um, our Paleolithic ancestors and the Paleolithic times are from roughly 10,000 BCE to two and a half million years BCE, roughly, right, um, evolved, evolved to eat a narrow range of foods. Right. And if we want to uh, be healthy in these modern times, what we should do is we should restrict our diets to these foods to which the human, um, the human um, digestive system had evolved to um, take advantage of. So what does it mean to be paleo? Um, again, here in loose terms, the paleo diet is based on the types of foods presumed to have been eaten by early humans before the advent of agriculture. Okay, so we have a hypothesis sitting on top of a hypothesis, right? And these foods included meat and seafood, nuts, seeds, roots, tubers, fruits, and berries. The diets of our ancient Paleolithic ancestors presumably excluded dairy, grains, and highly refined foods. All right, so again, presumably. And this is, this is just, okay, let's think about that. We can take a look at sort of the indigenous tribes of the um, African savanna and veldt. So we could take the Maasai, for example, and a large parts of their diet are based on milk and blood, right? And um, so I, I'm trouble, you know, having trouble figuring out how both of those things fit into this diet. You know, in modern times, their diet has shifted to include um, a lot of tubers, a lot of things that um, we would now be considered paleo. But historically, there are lots of things um, that I don't see anywhere. The same thing is true of um, peoples that live above the Arctic Circle. If you take a look at their diet, it's, it's, it's like almost exclusively animal fat. Um, you know, there aren't a whole lot of vegetables that grow above um, the Arctic Circle. And so, okay, you know, or nuts or seeds or any of these other things. So what does that mean, All right? And so you get, again, from the standard, the definition of the paleo standards, the diet is theoretical, right? And it's open up for wide interpretation. No single unified paleo diet definition exists. And I first ran across this definition, quote unquote, when I had a chance to meet the founder of Hugh, H-U, Kitchen, um, at the Fancy Food Show in New York, I think 2017, 2018. And I asked him the question, how can chocolate be paleo? Because, you know, in, so in paleolithic times, were our ancestors consuming cacao seeds? There's no archeological evidence that that was in fact the case. Um, and his answer to me was, well, it depends on what you mean by paleo. 
And my reading of the definition is paleo is pretty much um, anything that um, you want it uh, to be. And that is, um, that is um, if you look at the standard itself, um, one of the things that the standard says um, is that, um, excuse me for a moment while I go find it, um, is that they're focused, maybe I put it here. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't. Um, the diet is focused on a couple of issues. The modern certification of paleo is founded on a couple of um, ideas having to do with the fact that um, the thing, the, the, the products that are paleo, um, that are listed as paleo, there is an aspect of tolerability. Um, there is an aspect of, um, um, you, you, so tolerability is the notion that you, you can find the product, for example. Availability becomes an issue of it, um, an issue with respect to the standard. Um, and so, um, again, we need to look very, very carefully at what it is to be paleo, right? Um, so in that particular case, um, um, what it means to be paleo is an extreme, oh, here we go, it's at the very top of the document. So there are more major, more major factors that uh, influence diet tolerability. So this has to do with this whole notion of whether something can be um, certified as paleo. So number one is that the products that you want to certify as paleo must be available, right? They have to be affordable. I don't know what affordability has to do with right the notion that somehow paleo is is legit or not um, palatable it needs to be tasty i think right it needs to be convenient so so if diet tolerability is in fact a major component right of the paleo di diet so tolerability as defined by availability affordability palatability and convenience then it turns out that whatever you want to define um, to be an ingredient um, that is paleo, you can engage in some sort of post hoc rationalization to be able to incorporate it. So here is a list of ingredients from the standard that are allowable. It may be amended from time to time, right? But we have um, meats, um, grass fed, forage fed, pastured. Well, before agriculture, so nobody would have been pasturing, right? Um, probably. Armnivores should be pastured. Poultry must be cage-free, right? Wild-caught seafood, bivalves may be farmed. Again, you know, 10,000 years ago, was anybody farming bivalves? I don't understand why all of a sudden that's part of the standard. All fruits are allowed, right? I can go to a tree, pick it up. Um, not quite clear how our ancestors, paleo ancestor, had made juices from them. Um, they may have dried them to preserve them. Not quite certain upon them. True nuts and seeds, now, it, it turns out that cocoa um, fits into this notion of fruits. Technically, cocoa, um, the cacao pod is a droop. And so chocolate is made from the seeds of a fruit. And so cocoa should theoretically fall into the fruit category, maybe the nuts and seeds category if you want to push it. Um, but, but for some reason, it's sitting here in the oil and fat category. We have cocoa mass, cocoa butter. Don't know where cocoa nibs are. Right, so sort of weird that they're not considered there, but coke. There's no way the cocoa butter is not a highly processed food, right? So donors are certainly our ancestors weren't expressing cocoa fat from beans. Um, our paleo ancestors weren't doing that. So this is, you know, for me, in a sense of you know we've got something which is arbitrary. We have something which is theoretical, and what we're trying to do is we're we're trying to play um, games in order to figure out how to how to make it fit. And these are semantic games in order to figure out how to make it fit. Right. For me, sweeteners, man, birch xylitol. So xylitol is um, generated by um, an enzymatic reaction. It's, it's like yeast synthesis. There's no way that xylitol would have been something that our ancestors would have been you making um, more than 10,000 years ago. Why does it exist here? Right. There's no reason why it exists here except to make. Right the paleo diet items fit within their definition of tolerability, uh, which 
again, you know, makes no sense to me. I mean, one of the things that going back to being a raw vegan for a while is that raw vegans who are truly committed are truly committed. They're not going to do anything which is going to make their life easy, right? If it, if it, if it means giving up any aspect of being raw, um, f- uh, again, a raw vegan, um, they're going to go to all of the work necessary to ensure that what they're doing is in fact raw by their definition. And so to say that the paleo diet is, you know, f- goes back to where our ancestors were many thousands of years ago, except where it's convenient, right? So, you know, medium high oleic sunflower oil, I'm sorry, how is that? I mean, we have all these things. How is lecithin, right? Right. Um, I don't care what it's described from sunflower, right? Why not non-GMO soy? Hard to, hard to understand why that would be the case. Um, all of these tapioca malmaltodextrin, I mean, uh, you know, this is where this notion of making it convenient and not making pale, or just is where the entire theoretical foundation is like, you know, just give it up. All right. Right. Sodium dioxide, talc, calcium silicate. These are um, anti cacin agents. And for me, this is one of the weirdest kinds of things. It's like, why is unrefined cane juice, right, listed under grasses and not over here as sweeteners, right? And why is cane juice, which actually requires a fair amount of processing in order to be able to get, why does it even exist in this context? Would our ancestors 10,000 years ago have been extracting? We don't know. I don't know if there's a whole lot of architectural evidence for it, but let's go figure it. But there is, in fact, all right, an entire research article um, which is um, devoted to can sugarcane juice without additional refinement be certified paleo. Now, again, here is an interesting bit of research. This Kay Pendergrass is, um, is, I believe, the executive director of the paleo certification organization. So if we go here and we scroll up, she is um, on the paleo foundation standards team. So for me, there is this slight... Um, bit of, okay, um, um, complicity in terms of what's going on. But you'll notice, it's interesting, there's a community standards process. Here are the arguments, right? Sugar cane or sugar plant was not available in the area that Paleolithic humans occupied. Okay. The technology to produce sugar cane juice did not exist that long ago. Maybe, maybe not. Sugar cane, well, glycemic index, what does that got to do with being paleo, right? If it was available for our humans to eat, it's like the human, the human body is like hardwired to love sweet and fat. And if they found an easy way to um, produce sugarcane juice, they would have done it irrespective of the glycemic index. The glycemic index was not a concept that our paleolithic ancestors understood. It does not contain any nutrients. Um, that's not quite the case. Um, if you actually have raw, if you actually take sugar cane and you press it and you drink the juice and you examine the fresh juice, there are actually quite a few nutrients in it. Um, sugar cane juice is unhealthy. Um, yeah, but, you know, what does that got to do with being paleo? It's not part of the paleo argument, which is that it would have been a food available to our ancestors pre-agriculture, right? Um, the paleo diet is low carb and does not include any sugary foods. Again, that's a modern post-enlightenment kind of concept. Um, it is probably not anything that would have um, bothered or come to the minds of our Paleolithic um, predecessors. So we have logical arguments, but you take a look and, you know, the vast majority of the community, nearly a plurality, nearly 50% of the community says that sugar cane can't be considered paleo. You got roughly a quarter of the community says that it can, maybe, and with a very high percentage of people who didn't have a comment. And yet, when you come down here, there is a bit of, there is an enormous post hoc rationalization when it comes to arguments. And in the end, what they're going to do is they're going to say that there are things that our paleo ancestors never would have thought about. Antioxidants, right? Antihepatotic capabilities, immunotherapy, right? These are not things that are associated with anything. These are post-enlightenment modern notions of what, you know, we think, um, we presume, right, might have been the case 
uh, many, many thousands of years ago. All right. And um, yeah, so in the end, the decision is made that um, sugarcane with mineral processing meets the basic tenets, right? So, right, it's most likely to be um, opposed, but nonetheless, if you include um, cane sugar, unrefined cane juice in your product, uh, it can be considered to be paleo. So for me, all right, this whole, this constru the construction of this list, right? So cassava flour, you know, when did the technology to remove the cyanide components come into existence? If we take a look at olive oil, for example, it looks like the technology to produce olive oil did not exist prior to about 3500 BCE, 2500 BCE, 3500 BCE. And so olive oil would not have been something that um, Paleolithic people would have been consuming. So, okay, um, why is it on this list, right? Right. And this is, this, is, this is the challenge that I have um, with the, uh, the paleo diet. So the answer is, is how can chocolate be paleo is it all depends on what you mean by paleo, right? And paleo as a concept is so fungible, right? And so amenable towards particular individual interpretation that pretty much almost anything in the world um, could be justified as paleo. Well, maybe not Twinkies. I don't think, well, it would be interesting to see. Could I, could I come up with a paleo Twinkie from things that are on this list? Probably. I could probably come up with a paleo almost Twinkie. Um, so anyway, uh, again, I don't want to talk you out of this diet if it's interesting to you, right? Go follow it. Just be aware of what it is and what it isn't. I mean, so for example, people who know me will know that over the course of the last couple of years, I've dropped about 30, 35 pounds. And I've, I've done it all right, by following um, just a diet, which is just moderated carbohydrates. It's not a keto diet. It's not an Adkins diet. I just did some work and said, okay, what is 100 grams of net carbs? My doctor said 100 grams of net carbs a day. Um, try to contain your diet under that. Don't care how you consume them, when, right, in what form, just think about what under 100 grams of carbs a day. And so I did some research and I said, you know, here's the carb content of this food and okay, I can have this much of this. And I organized my life and by walking um, during COVID, I was able to drop 35 pounds. If the paleo diet for you works as a way of organizing your eating as part of a weight, weight loss goal, if the raw diet, right, helps you organize your eating as a part of a weight loss or other goal, it could be an ethical goal, right? You just you know, being a raw vegan, right, has got a bunch of different ethical considerations tied up in it. I don't want you to dissuade you from doing it. Um, if it works for you and you are healthy doing it, um, it's just that consider, right, the actual aspects of what it means to be raw and what it means to be paleo. So looking at ingredients on paleo products and going, oh, chocolate, which contains cane sugar, juice. No, it's not. And it's juice. I can't use cane juice. I actually have to dehydrate the juice. I have to remove the water from it, which requires a certain amount of technology. Um, I can't just cook it down. I can get something like piloncillo, all right, um, which is a very, very dark, very, very molassesy taste. But when we talk about unrefined cane juice, right, so unrefined sugar, it's done by a very different process, which is very high technology. And we need to consider, right, doesn't, you know, what does that mean? with respect to the overall goals of the diet. So from a links perspective, um, so I just wanted to, uh, I've got this link to a document about the enzymatic synthesis of xylitol. So when the standard says Burt xylitol, you can go, oh, this is what it takes to actually manufacture xylitol. You can decide if it's paleo or not, but this is an example um, of what's going on. Um, so um, I do um, then do the link to the, the document about can sugarcane juice be certified and then a link to the paleo standards um, itself if you are intrigued at all by this argument. Again, six points, right? Right. The human diet, the human, there's one, no, no one diet that humans evolved to thrive on, right? If you take a look at the different environments that people, that humans evolved in from the African savanna up to um, the Arctic Circle, um, there is no one diet. And to suggest that all humans on the planet 10,000 years ago ate the same things, I think is 
number one, a misunderstanding, right? Number two, um, there was a lot of evolution, right, in plants and animals uh, in the climate going on over the roughly two and a half millions of the paleo diet to suggest that there is a particular snapshot in time and the paleo diet existed this time as opposed to that time, for me, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Again, the modern construction of the paleo diet is entirely theoretical. It appears to be a product of post-enlightenment thinking of um, the way that our ancestors lived. Um, this focus on tolerability, especially convenience, right? So we're going to allow things to be considered paleo that make it convenient, right, for these foods to be processed and um, packaged so that we can consume them. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, right? Um, so again, this post hoax rationalization of ingredients like unrefined cane juice, again, man, I got a real challenge with that. Um, and then specifically with respect to chocolate, um, just this misclassification of chocolate in the fats and oils category as opposed to the fruit category. Chalk cocoa should be allowed. Cocoa mass, cocoa nibs, whole beans should be allowed in my, my feeling under the definition of fruits because it is a seed from a fruit and maybe it's not a nut, but it's all true nuts and seeds. Eh, okay. Um, but definitionally, you know, why is mustard seed under nuts? You know, it should be nuts and seeds. I'm just, it's, 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 it's poorly crafted in my opinion. Um, and could use a lot of work from someone who's thinking on the language. Um, so I did um, put some other resources. If you're interested in purchasing the book, Food Rules, if you haven't read it, it's a lot of fun. I can recommend it. Um, Cooked, A Natural History of Transformation. Again, another book that I can recommend if you're interested in these kinds of issues. If you haven't read Michael Pollan, perhaps his most um, influential book is one called Omnivore's Dilemma. Um, it's not linked to here. Um, but um, you can get it, uh, you can get to it from any of these, either of these two pages that are listed here. So I can recommend um, any of those resources. And of course, purchasing um, helps support the chocolate life. Doesn't cost you anything else. Uh, these are Amazon affiliate links. So I appreciate that. Um, just wanted to heads up in case it's not obvious. And then finally, um, we had some time and I wanted to talk about um, this, which came, which was brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago. Um, is that there is a company in Germany that is talking about uh, untempered chocolate, right? And what they want to do is bring out the authentic flavor of the bean and its terroir. And so uh, they are, in fact, um, promoting selling uh, untempered chocolate. And you can purchase, um, well, so you can purchase a master set um, and a master set uh, includes um, a storage box, a chocolate mold. And then what you get is you get these little pouches of untempered chocolate. So uh, I, this appears to be what we would think of as a craft chocolate maker. So somebody who's making this chocolate in small quantities and um, um, they're making it from the bean directly. Uh, and what you do is you take these silver pouches and then you put them in hot water and you melt the silver pouches, right? Um, once the, the chocolate is melted, you cut the tip off an end. So you have what looks to be a pastry piping bag. And then you'll fill a mold with the chocolate, put it in the refrigerator, and then boom, you'll eat it um, very, very quickly. It's untempered. So... If, you know, if you take it out of the fridge and it's going to get very, very soft, very, very quickly um, in normal room temperature and it will melt and your fingers will get dirty and things like that. So, um, so here is somebody who has had the idea is that one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like working with chocolate is because they've heard it's this thing called tempering and tempering appears to be a black art, right? But what if we can do is we can sell you chocolate where what you do is you mold it at the last minute, right? And you make it yourself. And then what you can do is you can go and um, have chocolate, um, um, which is, again, perhaps more authentic, which is one of the claims that they're making. One of the things I think is interesting is they've got four flavor profiles, classic, fruity, fine, and crazy. There's no definition here about that I was able to find of what these... Um, different flavor profiles are like. 
Um, and I got to admit, you know, uh, this is, um, you know, it's, it's done in black and white. Um, it is, you know, really, really, you know, quite pretty. The photography is good. Um, it's not cheap. So you get um, four different, um, uh, four different little silver packets of chocolate. Um, you get a mold. I don't know if you get more than one mold. You get this little storage box and um, it costs 60 euros. If I just want to buy a single one of the chocolates, um, these little packets are 12 euros a piece. Um, it's not entirely, it's not stated anywhere what the weight is, what you're getting for the 12 euros of chocolate. Um, and so my question for you who might be watching this live, whether in YouTube, um, LinkedIn, or Facebook, um, is what you think about the notion of untempered chocolate. Um, do you think it's fashionable? Do you think it's a fad? Um, is it something that you'd like to try for yourself? Um, if somebody would like um, um, to support the effort, I see if I can go order some and do a live tasting um, at a Chocolate Life in the future. Um, let me know and we'll see what it is that we can do. But I'm very, very curious to know whether people um, think that this notion of um, untempered chocolate um, is one that is um, fashionable one that you think will catch on, one that you think will um, um, find a favorable place in the market, um, or whether you think that it is just a fad. Um, I noticed, I don't remember if this was, um, uh, so this is not actually a link that can be followed. So I don't know that it is a, um, a product. Um, that can be purchased, even though it's linked here um, as a couverture. So you can buy untempered couverture um, if you want from them. So um, yeah, so please uh, let me know what you think about this whole process. And with that, um, we're at the end of the hour. I want to thank everybody who stayed through today. Um, I appreciate the likes um, and um, people, if you have um, the, the time, um, please go and um, let people know, um, like the video, share, comment, subscribe, um, whether it's on LinkedIn, on Facebook, or, or on YouTube, or on thechocolatelife.com. Um, again, here is the homepage of thechocolatelife.com today, right now. Um, I am having problems with the search, not understanding, just stopped working. So search is not working at the moment. We're looking to try to make it, uh, try to figure out what went wrong. Uh, we didn't do anything. It just stopped working. So trying to make that work. Um, but um, um, you can support the work that we're doing here at The Chocolate Life by clicking on join. There is a free tier. There's always been a free tier since 2008 when I started. Um, but if you'd like to um, join and support um, on a paid tier, you can pay monthly, you can pay yearly, and there's a bunch of benefits at the each different levels. You know, I understand that um, you know, dollars are difficult to come by right now. And so I appreciate the commitment, understand what the commitment means and want to say thank you to everybody who does join as a free member um, or who has the resources to support what I'm doing with, um, with a monetary um, a pledge of support. Uh, with that, it's uh, Tuesday um, and we'll be back on Friday with the next Chocolate Life Live. Um, looking to put together something special, looking for a guest, try, haven't been able to, um, to be able to um, you know, um, confirm them um, because of the holiday weekend. Not everybody is going to be available because of Memorial Day weekend here in the United States. But to remind everybody that it is Tuesday. It is an election here in the United States. If you're in a state for which there's a primary, go out and vote. Uh, I think it's a really, really important aspect of civic uh, engagement. So please, everybody, um, if you um, are in the United States uh, and you are in a state where um, voting is happening today, um, go out and do it. And with that, thank you again, everybody. Uh, just a quick reminder as I end every broadcast that um, if you're working with chocolate and you are not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Until the next time.